Hi, good, uh, good day, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu, and, and I'm Horia. Welcome. And today we have Johan Stein, all the way from South Africa, with us today. Good morning, James. Oh, well, I guess it's good evening for you, but it's a great honor to be here, and I look forward to this conversation. Very good, thank you. So what we do in the beginning of every Focus episode is, is that we actually explain why you were a guest uh, on, on the podcast. And funny thing is, is that I've met Johan in 2010 when we worked together for an organization in Johannesburg. And I was the guy that was doing the, the actual work and Johan was the guy that, that smooched all the customers and <laughs> made them feel really good about themselves. Um, but ever, ever, since, ever since we met, uh, we've, we've done a few things together. We even capsized the raft together um, on, the, on one of the rivers there in South Africa. Um, but Johan has, uh, has always been a curious person and he's since uh, since since I've met him he's really always been trying to gain solid experience in whatever endeavors he had and one of the the things that and we're going to be talking about two parts a little bit uh, in today's interview is he's got solid experience with roles with accountability and oversight um, Johan also self-published two books over the last number of years, and these days he keeps himself uh, occupied with this little thing called AI, which we, would, which we would really want to cover with you as well in the second part of this interview. But I'm not going to tell you all about Johan. Um, Johan is the best person that can share his river of life, his journey up to here with us. Thank you, Aldo, for that. Uh, and I, I forgot about the capsizing the, the raft. <laughs> I lost my very expensive Oakley sunglasses in that uh, exercise, but <laughs> good memories. No, so um, look, I've been in uh, technology or, or call it sales or even consulting uh, for most of my career. I, in the last, I would say six years, I made a pivot towards small AI, which we'll, we'll speak about today. Uh, but just hungry for information you know it's i don't have a technical background everything i know is pretty much self-taught reading as many books as i can speaking to as many people as i can and i discovered that there's a lot more common sense in a lot of these seemingly complex technologies that than we realize and a lot of people especially very technical people try and overcomplicate it in my opinion but i've you know started uh, writing a lot you know i write weekly for a local business newspaper here. I think today is my 59th weekly article. So every week it's a bit daunting. What am I going to write about next? <laughs> I do a, quite a lot of public speaking. So last year in, in lockdown, I did 31 conferences uh, remotely. Uh, now there's a bit more in person. But it is really for me about, you know, helping clients with some common sense strategy stuff around this technology. And um, guys, so my greatest passion, however, is the societal impact of this technology. I've got an eight-year-old son. I think about him and his, his generation's future. There are some potential really horrible scenarios for where this technology could go, which I'm sure we'll unpack. But yeah, look, half the time, I think if people know what I know, they won't speak with me. I'm just hungry to learn more. And so, <laughs> let's see what we're going to... I might not be able to answer some of your questions, and I'll be honest about it. That's all good. And... Uh, like I said, we explore together this domain, um, the the oversight domain, um, which uh, is is any any person that needs to oversee how the money is spent. There's board uh, action, there's some PMO action, there's some project uh, action as well. But we we're not just looking at the technical ways of doing it. We're also considering the humans um, and the behavioral science that's associated with some of that uh, as well. But let's get into this. Um, wanted to look at, uh, you, you've made a few comments just with a start um, about common sense uh, in technology and so on. Um, that, that's quite an interesting thing because many people will think they are applying common sense when they are creating or um, elaborating or using technology to automate things out there for them. 
Um, what are what are some of the the aspects that you notice that is not so common? Seems. Yeah, I think firstly, people don't really understand the various technologies. Uh, so, for instance, we know that robotic process automation and artificial intelligence, although there are some overlaps, are vastly different kinds of technologies. So I, I had a client the other day that said, I need to implement AI in my business. How many robots do I need? And I said, we are talking about very different things. So, so one of the things I've seen is that people easily throw around a lot of words and acronyms. They've read it in a Gartner Forrester report or they, they went to a conference. So I often say, let's just stop and make sure we compare apples with apples. So that's the one thing. I don't think people use the right words and they also don't understand how to use technology for the right things they often in automation where i've done a lot of work i often say automate the right things for the right reasons in the right ways um and you know and i say tongue-in-cheek you can't automate stupidity you can't automate the toxic culture you can't automate people who fear for their jobs you know and that's where the and i like what but you also said earlier and, and from your other recordings that i've seen there there's a much larger humanity and psychology um, and philosophical element to all of this stuff than just the technology. You know, human nature is also something you can't automate. You know, we are tribal, we are often selfish. Um, we can easily storm the castle gates with our pitchforks if we think we're going to start losing our jobs. You know, so this thing called change management, which we can do so theoretical, but, you know, it's really, it's for me, guys, about being really interested in people and seeing their value. And second to that is the technology. So one of the, the big reasons, and I hope that answers the, the question I'll do, is because we discard or maybe minimize the impact on humans and the value of humans and the resistance from humans, a lot of these initiatives, technological or, or, or other, often fail or don't deliver the value mm -hmm. we anticipated. In Kiwi land, in New Zealand, some, sometimes they talk about it's the too hard basket. So if something is too hard, so it goes into the too hard basket and it stays there. So we just focus on the, on the, on the little things here. But it's quite interesting that you find that technology people overcomplicate things. And when we, when we look at that statement, um, I've been guilty of it as well um you you worked with me you saw some of the work but um what what uh, what, what we um notice as well is is that where people fear the loss of control that is where they probably try and overcomplicate things in an attempt to gain control yeah absolutely again back to fundamental human nature you know we because, you know, the work we do is very close to our lives because it's our livelihood. Mm. We think about um, building for the future. We think about uh, sending our children to school. You know, so there's are many things that you can kind of mess around with and I won't be so bothered about it. But when it comes to my livelihood and my future, then if need be, the ugliest part of me can come out to make sure I protect myself. And that's the mm. tribal thing. And it's not a bad thing. It's human nature. But, mm. you know, and maybe if I can use one example, um, and, and we might jump around a bit, but, you know, I did some work for a large hospital group here in South Africa. They've got about 84 hospitals. And in their, their, their kind of flagship hospital, which is like the head office, we had a meeting with the senior executives in a boardroom uh, about automating their front desk functions you know so when you walk into the hospital to see a doctor or if you arrive with pain uh, that you know those kind of things we've all been into hospitals and they were drawing all kinds of crazy schematics on the whiteboard I mean they have thought this through and I stopped them and I said forgive me uh, if I offend you but have you actually spoken to the people whose jobs you are trying to automate and they said no because they had some big shot consulting firm in there to give them the strategy. And I said, I'm not willing to help you. And they said, why? I said, unless you give me permission to sit down with some of these people, to hear from them in the trenches what will make their lives easier, we're going to automate stuff that doesn't need automation or, or at least we're not going to take people on the journey with us. Mm -hmm. So I then sat with 20 of these people over a coffee, very relaxed, just asking them about their jobs, what will make life easier. 
there's two things that happen there. Firstly, you gain insights that are incredibly important for the automation journey, things you wouldn't have known if you haven't spoken to the people. Secondly, you gain their buy-in and support to make this mm -hmm. a um, effective journey. The one big thing I found from all these interviews is that the printer is too far from them. So for every um, patient engagement on average, they have to get up three times and walk to the printer to get documents to be, to be signed and scanned and stuff. So we move the printer closer to them. It increased the effectiveness and efficiency and the productivity immensely. Was it AI or automation or digitization? It's simple things. So yes, there's great value in all this sexy technology, but just dumb it down and speak with the people uh, whose jobs it's going to impact. There are so many things in their day-to-day -day jobs that, you know, if you're on the top of the stack in the boardroom, you don't, can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. you know, so that is, that's why, and, and the other thing in automation is a lot of automation conversations start with the so-called FTE reduction. You know, we want to get rid of people and that's the business case for automating. Um, and it's funny that we don't call them people, we'll call them resources or full-time mm -hmm. equivalents. <laughs> yes. Here in South Africa, um, we, on average, every wage owner looks after six or seven other family members. So to get rid of 10 people, it doesn't impact 10 people, you know. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, how we can turn that conversation of FTE reduction around, but again, starting with the value of humans. And I'm not saying, and I'll maybe end off with this, I'm not saying it's Kumbaya and the <coughs> Red Cross. We have businesses that are under constant pressure to perform shareholder pressure you know every one percentage of revenue gain is incredible but why is it exclusive why can't we both grow our business and really look after our people i don't think it's it's not possible mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of thinking and work to get that right well you're going to get warrior going on that topic he feels really <laughs> good about that as well um but what you're touching on as well as it's not just from an automation perspective but when we look at it from um, the perspective of oversight or people in oversight capabilities or responsibilities of oversight, hiding behind what the computer sees or what the checklist sees, etc., removes you from that human interaction and the actual understanding. Um, tell us a little bit about a story of where somebody in an oversight, a governance or oversight position has just blindly implemented something that had a lot of hurt uh, out there uh, in the wider organization. When, uh, when we worked uh, for this organization in, in Johannesburg in 2010, and one thing I kept noticing as a software tester is, is that it's always the people that they least expect that gets hurt the most. And because you're, you sit totally as a software tester at the end of that whole discussion of software, et cetera, um, you're the one that gets squeezed because we, what, what, we, we, we are we going to cut time of our projects? So, sorry, that, that's the reason why I asked it. Yeah, I just I want to just quickly segue before I answer your question. You know, now, software testing, as, as many of you know, is I've, I've often called it the stepchildren of the SDLC, because like you said, Aldo, they, in, a, in a typical, we'll call it waterfall, or we can call it whatever. I mean, most of these projects are quite a mess, and we squeeze at the end. The testers are the ones taking the brunt of the pressure, and they and a lot of business leaders or, or say, um, PMOs, etc., think testers are, oh, do we really need them? And, you know, that's why we don't really want to pay them, don't really listen to them. And luckily, over, over the last few years, I think since that time, the role of quality engineering has increased dramatically, the need for quality products. You know, there's a lot more talk about so-called software development engineers and tests or getting hardcore developers to become quality engineers. But in the age of smart technology that's infiltrating our lives, the need for quality software is exponentially increasing. You know, if we talk about automated decisioning systems, these machine learning systems, um, um, or autonomous automation, and so forth. So if my credit score or even my access to healthcare is determined by an algorithm, I sure as heck hope the quality is good. 
<laughs> so on that segue, I think the role of, but the testers also need to upskill and not just stay, say, for instance, manual testers and the like, but it is an exciting career to be in for those who are in it if they upskill themselves and, and, you know, because we're getting to a point now of how do we test AI systems or use AI to test. But anyway, so, so one example um, is I worked for a, a large organization and the chief information officer was taken on a trip to Silicon Valley. Now, this was a 110 year old organization with 40,000 people. So you can imagine the, the amount of politics and siloed ways of working and the like. So the CIO visited Google and Spotify and Alibaba and, and Facebook, and which is great, but we knew that he was gonna come back with all these great new ideas. And yeah, so what they did is they wanted to Spotify this 40,000 people, 110 year old business, because now suddenly it's tribes and guilds and, and we know the Spotify model is quite incredible. I think if you're a young, exciting digital company, it most likely works well. And one of the things they did is they took, I think they were about 400 project managers and in, by the click of a button, they made them all scrum masters. Okay, change the titles. Okay. And we know it's, it's a, such a different kind of role. So the, it was chaos because they, a lot of these PMs didn't understand their new roles. A lot of the teams, because that, that command and control stayed there, even though we said it's a scrum or a stand-up stand mm -hmm. meeting. So that's maybe one example, you know, and it's so easy to look at just the spreadsheets and the BI dashboard and say, mm, okay, click here, and it changes the lives of so many people. Well, even if it doesn't change their lives in the sense of they lose their jobs, if it changes their, because why do we feel happy and satisfied when we do a job is if we feel we're equipped, if we feel we add value, if we feel we learn, you know, that gives us some sort of satisfaction. Mm. But if you rip that carpet out of under somebody's feet by rapidly just changing their ways of working and roles, the chaos that causes the heartache, you know, and then you go home at night to your family after a horrible day, months on end. So that's kind of on a large scale. And I've seen small examples as well, but yes, Easy to sit all behind the screen, look at some spreadsheets and a few um, graphs and click a button and change people's lives. It happens way too often, unfortunately, I think. And that's a failure of oversight. How do people mm -hmm. redeem themselves in that, in that situation? How do you, how do you suggest that um, organize, this organization that you just, uh, uh, the example that you just used, if somebody out there listens, um, and they feel that they need to make a change. How do, what do you do for that decision maker listening to this to not do the same thing? You, it is about being interested, really interested in your people, understanding them. And yes, the bigger the organization, the more difficult it is to have a, call it an intimate or a personal relationship or understanding with your staff. Um, we often have people doing, call it low level kind of jobs, but they've got such potential, they've got so many good ideas, but it's not only that they're not being heard, it's just they don't even believe there's an opportunity to say something, and they most likely have learned in the previous time they gave an idea, it was just discarded. So it's, I think it's about, it's about true leadership. And it's about knowing your people. And yes, business leaders sometimes need to make hard decisions. They need to make decisions that might impact a lot of people. I mean, if, if your organization is struggling and you have to go through retrenchments, for instance, it, because often the choice is between we go down as a company or we try and get rid of some people to make sure we still stay afloat. I understand that that's sometimes a, a kind of you're between a rock and a hard place. But firstly, it should bother you as a business leader. It should cause you sleepless nights, but, and you have to make the hard decisions. But you have to understand the value and the promise and the potential of the people in your organization. And that counts for the leadership layers from the top all the way to the bottom. You know, And then it's about taking people on that journey with you. So we're going to make this change. This is why we believe it will be good for us. What do you think? What is your, and again, so many great ideas in the, in the, call it the populace of the organization with no opportunity to say something or be heard. That's, I think that's where it starts. 
it's real interesting your people and also knowing your people. Mm. There's a great book that I thought about earlier this morning before our call, and I, I can't recall the author's name now. It's a man, and the book is called something like Why Are So Many Men Horrible Leaders? It's most mm. likely not the exact title. Also a great TED talk. Yes. And it's great that the man wrote it, but it's such a good book about leadership and especially about because we still live in a very male-dominated corporate world. Uh, globally he speaks a bit about testosterone and competitiveness uh, and the like um, but again back to the philosophy of leadership the psychology of people the value of people those are the filters through which we should make these decisions and the hard decisions often as i've said mm -hmm. just now we, we've come to the conclusion on a few occasions uh, on the focus uh, podcast that um, ultimately oversight and governance is about people um, if you if you if you don't consider that, then you do end up in bureaucracy or marginalized or whatever the case might be. I'm going to just drop this ball in Horia's uh, lap here. Consider the wider social, uh, environmental uh, impact. Here's my concern: the way that our current economic system is set up we have um, all sorts of perils in front of us. Um, we've had boom and bust cycles um, almost um, predictably uh, hit us. And our relationship with capital has been um, a little bit frayed. Now, what technology brings us as a promise is the, um, the freeing up of humans from the slavery of having to be tied to keyboards and click away. Um, therefore, many more humans can be freed up from that. What we haven't figured out is what are we going to do socially? Uh, in other words, yeah, I don't have to be um, near a keyboard and do that kind of work. But if I'm not doing that kind of work, what other kind of work can I do? And if uh, there's enough shall we say, um, uh, economic um, capability without the need for human intervention. Uh, again, let's, let's assume, uh, hypothetically speaking, that um, we have devised such marvelous machines of invention and uh, general artificial intelligence driven uh, devices can undertake all of the work that humans could otherwise engage in. Yeah, what do we do as humans? Uh, will we still have the intense polarization that we have right now, with a, a tiny fraction of humans owning enormous financial resources and vast amounts of humanity um, being in abject poverty? Uh, what do we do? So, um, funnily enough. Uh, these are not technological questions. These are, these are not um, challenges of technology. They are sociological and political uh, questions. They are ethical questions uh, that we need to address as humans, right? In other words, yes, we have machines that can plow the fields and grow crops and make other uh, devices and whatever else we require from uh, food to clothing to transportation, all our needs may be uh, met without having to exert um, human um, energy for it. But what then? Yeah. So I have a suspicion that we have um, quite a lot of interesting uh, challenges in front of us as to how do we um, engage more of our compassion, more of our kindness, more of our gentleness? How do we reinvent capitalism in such a way that um, we make things fair for the vast majority of humans? What are your thoughts in this space, Johan? It's way too early for me to open a bottle of scotch, but I wish I could <laughs> right now. <laughs> because this, I love this, these kind of call it philosophical uh, talks. I mean, if we all had, if we were sitting at a fire now with a scotch and cigars, we could go for hours. Oh, that's You've mentioned so many things. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should, well, we can have a Zoom one and we can have to flip a coin yeah. about who's going to do it early in the morning or not. Um, <clears throat> so many things you've said. Um, 
there's this story that I want to start off with. You know, in the 1930s, Stalin, I imagine working for a boss like that in Soviet uh, Russia, he tasked the foremost economist in the Soviet Union, Nikolai Kondratiev, to go and investigate Western democracies and Western capitalism with the goal of saying why or explaining and justifying really why, why Soviet-style communism is superior because of these bust and booms that you prefer to, Horio. And um, after an extensive study, he came back and most likely shivering in his pants like I would have to tell his boss, Stalin, that the premise is untrue. But even though there are busts and booms in Western democracies and economies, <clears throat> it is by far superior to Soviet-style communism. He rightfully expected a knock at the door and he was taken to the gulag. And later during the so-called Great Purge, he was shot by an execution squad. But he, he came up with these waves of innovation. And then his contemporary Schumpeter started speaking about so-called creative destruction. So a lot of my talks about AI, I start with these, these kind of stories. They, and they call it the conductria for the K waves. And if you Google it, you'll see these waves of, of ups and downs in, in Western style capitalism. A lot of it is triggered by technological innovation, you know, from the, the water powered, steam powered, horse powered, we know all these so-called industrial revolutions. Uh, but there's this natural cycle. We're currently in what Kondratiev would have called the sixth wave, which is spurred on by this era of smart technologies. Now, this leads me to the question of what do we do with all the people? Because, I mean, our populace is growing exponentially. I mean, they reckon in the next, was it 10 years, we'll most likely be 10 billion people on Earth. You know, I think we've got a massive natural resources problem. Uh, there's already food scarcity in the world, especially due to the, the Ukraine situation at the moment. You know, so, and, and I also agree with you, it's not technology per se. You know, it is, there's a big societal thing. Now, this is where the whiskey should come in. I think capitalism is most likely the better of the various systems out there, but it is fundamentally flawed. You know, the other author or thinker is Yuval Noah Harari. You might be familiar with his work, Sapien, 21 lessons for 21st century, Homo Deus, love his stuff. He speaks about the potential creation of the so-called useless class, where we automate so much of the work that humans can do. And that brings us to one of two um, scenarios. The one is utopian, which is kind of what you've referred to, where life really is better for most people on earth, where we don't have to do all the the work that we hate doing what then do we look at you know some sort of a national structure or income of sorts because well how am i going to earn money to buy food if i can sit at home and robots clean my house and and do everything the other scenario is dystopian which is what Harari is predicting and, and, and i seem to agree with him even though i'm not a negative person i do think we are going to create anything but a better world through technology because remember as humans we we uh, want power we want control. I mean, we see the social scoring system in China already. I think that'll infiltrate other countries where my behavior um, or my support for the regime impacts my ability to gain credit or to health get health care or to put my child in a good school. Uh, we've seen the abuses of facial recognition that is very biased against people of color and females in particular. Um, Elon Musk, if he gets FDA approval this year through Neuralink, will do the first AI implants in human brains. The uh, potential benefit there is brain injury and uh, Alzheimer's. But imagine if the, if the AI can read and influence your thoughts. There goes democracy out the door right there. So yes, yeah, so I think this, I, I can go all over the show, but I think it's a valid point that we have to discuss. I don't think we are going to create a utopian world. We, I think we are going to create a dystopian world and, you know, a while back, I wrote two articles where I imagined my son was 35 in a few years from now, and I might still be around or not. But the one is where he thanks me and our generation for regulating this technology, making sure it's being used responsibly, um, influencing healthcare and the like. And the other article is the dystopian one where he blames us, his generation blames us collectively for not doing enough to control this technology, which is like nuclear power. You know, destroy a city or it can warm a city we are sitting on a time bomb here when it comes to this technology a lot of people don't like me saying it but i, I need to overemphasize it i've said a lot i don't have most like not even nearly asked, answered your question Corio, but 
Yeah, that's why the scotch is needed. No, it's think. it's very helpful. Um, you've essentially illuminated a perspective of, um, I will say, maybe a tinge of pessimism, <laughs> if you will. Mm. Uh, but personally, I'm mm. hopeful <clears throat> in the in the human spirit, um, and therefore I entertain optimism. Um, and I I do that because I believe humans are creatures of um, prevailing, of overcoming. Uh, we are feeling most alive, not when we spend day after day in um, the lap of luxury. I mean, imagine an enforced holiday in Bora Bora for months on end. Yeah. So after the 437th cocktail on the beach, what then? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on, <laughs> let me do something interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I get the feeling that, yes, we need refreshment, we need uh, leisure, but ultimately we are at our best when we're, when we're overcoming challenges, when we're doing interesting and great things. Well, that's not for all of us. You know? Some of us are perfectly content to just live a life of, of leisure and luxury. That's perfectly okay. Um, but um, many of us, uh, feel much more alive when we're actually engaged in uh, in service and being of value to others. Yeah. If you think of what's an excellent life, an excellent life perhaps isn't one that is utterly selfish in which I just um, uh, consider, look at me or pay attention to me or all the goodies need to be mine. Uh, Wait, so I need to take a selfie. Just... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> But perhaps an excellent life is one in which um, we find um, like-minded people with whom uh, we form tightly knit groups uh, that prevail and, and, and do and achieve great things uh, together, right? Because if you think about it, our whole traditions of, of sports, right? In sports, yes, you do have solo sports, but eh, the team sports seem to be a lot more enjoyable, right? I think of rugby in South Africa and New Zealand and Australia and so on. Think of the um, soccer or football of Europe or uh, the American football of, um, of America or, or, or baseball, right? These are, or uh, even basketball, uh, all of these are, are, are team sports. And we're, we're so um, engrossed in, in that team performance. And it's so awe-inspiring when you see a fantastic um, kind of collaboration and when the team really gels and you, wow, look at the, the past that just happened there, that, that insight, that amazing collaboration. Uh, therefore, um, I'm hopeful, yes, um, Artificial intelligence and then general artificial intelligence and so on is a tool. And as with any tool, you know, a knife is a knife is a knife. Is a knife can uh, prepare a nice meal or a knife can lead to gruesome torture. Um, how you use the knife is ultimately a matter of the intent of the person using that. So therefore, I'm hopeful that humans, uh, when engaging the use of the stool, will be mindful of others. And the would-be, shall we say, tyrants, well, there are words uh, throughout history, six emper tyrannis. Um, all tyrants uh, throughout history, none of them have had um, a long-lived um, shall we say, right. um, well, I was going to think uh, dynasty, yeah? Yes. Because um, ultimately, there is something in the human spirit that abhors um, being sort of locked in and crushed, yeah? I mean, um, if you think about it, even to this day, right now in 2022, Anno Domini, we still have slavery in parts of the world. It is conceived as, yeah, well, what to do, it is it is what it is. And we still have human trafficking, and we still have all sorts of <clears throat> dark happenings. As we speak, there are people firing missiles and shooting guns and killing each other in parts of the world that were fairly peaceful only a few short months ago. 
So even as we speak, humans are using tools in mm, inappropriate ways. He, humans are considering other humans as tools. And yet, many of us have shifted. There are now from, imagine uh, when the British Empire Deliberately, there were more and more people throughout the British Empire saying to themselves, you know what? Yeah, we've, we've made a lot of money out of this slavery thing, but it's wrong. It's not okay. Mm -hmm. And it cost a lot of money and a lot of time to overturn that. Yeah. So I see the history of humanity as, as, a, as a story of emerging from self-inflicted kind of slavery. If you will, uh, it's it's like a, a cry of the human spirit towards freedom, and that I think is absolutely wonderful. And I, I frankly don't see any kind of uh, technological tool as having any shot at at, at quenching the human spirit. I mean, uh, you you see the classic Matrix trilogy, right, where people are so hoodwinked they don't even know they're enslaved by the machines and even then the human spirit somehow damn it manages to capture neo and whoa you you have that that uh, sort of climax of yeah okay uh, let, let, let's form some kind of um of harmony shall we say so i therefore entertain hope for a much more harmonious and uh, i'm not calling it utopian because um if anything uh, is, is interesting and worthy of note is all the spiritual traditions aim towards unity. And therefore, showing respect to our fellow creatures is, is an essential aspect of it. So from that perspective, rather than looking at one another as you are superior, oh, my great boss, or you are inferior, oh, you puny minion, uh, and... Uh, particularly if we make a machine and the machine becomes aware, it may be very tempting to treat it as an it, as opposed to giving it all due respect as a fellow creature, because it happens to be self-aware. We haven't even started considering uh, anything to do with ethics or legislation of how do you engage with, how do you treat with a machine? Well, it's a machine awareness, a, mas a machine sentience. Should it not be worthy um, of equal respect. Uh, yes, we have things in parts of the world where we say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, why not all sentiences are created equal? <laughs> yeah. So, where's, the, where's that whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> so, good points, of, really good points. All of these things that you guys have mentioned, um, uh, I keep thinking uh, about this question is, is that it's still up to us to decide what it is that what is the choices that we're going to to be making in the future not just us but the humanity so my question from a, uh, an oversight perspective those people in in those oversight uh, capabilities or that has got that accountability what do they need to ask what do they need to do in order to head off a dystopian um, situation um, uh, going forward. What are the questions they need to ask now in order to hit that off? I'll do. I think, I'd, in my views, I don't think that's even possible. Um, but just to, to in, in answering your question to what Horio said, look, that I do agree. We, we as humans have, and this is why we love stories about heroism and like the Matrix or even the ancient Greek myths or others, because it's almost, I think, ingrained in our DNA is this wanting to overcome against all odds. That's the movies we like, really. And, and um, while you were talking, Horio, I was thinking of um, an academic and writer called Joseph Campbell, who I think has been dead a few years now, but yeah, and you know, the hero's journey. That's right. Um, that's right. And, uh, yeah. And he, why do we love movies or books that follows the hero's journey? Because it's almost in our DNA and to have super simplified and, you know, like Lion King is one of the best examples, but there's the so-called call to adventure. And then there's the rejection of the call. The hero runs away because he or she <clears throat> doubts themselves. And then eventually they go to the 
bottom of the pit where they face the dragon, which is their dark self, often their you know, dark side. And then they meet a wise man or woman, and then they emerge and they go all the way back to the so-called normal life. But those stories resonate with us. You know, if you look at most movies, say like a love story, run about, and you can time it, run about two thirds in. So it's boy meets girl against all odds. It's amazing, blah, blah, blah. And two thirds into the movie, there's a crisis. She discovers something about his past or whatever. And I mean, if the movie ended there, we would most likely kill ourselves, okay? <laughs> but then against all odds, they, they fall in love again, or the Euro, you know, Rocky, the boxer and stuff. So that's ingrained in us. Whether we will collectively be able to do that, because we're not even doing it now. Look at during the, the uh, there was the so-called vaccine wars, because nation states will protect them, themselves. You know, so we would rather keep more vaccines in our country, even if we don't need it, they'll most likely go to waste and share it with other poorer countries. What will we do with artificial general intelligence that will give us incredible military might, autonomous weapon systems, total control of the data of the world? We have this ability to make it good. For me, my read of history is just, I don't think as humans, we have the, a, when a push comes to shove, we have the ability to be altruistic. A quote I once read, and the quote said, in every civilized man, there is a pagan waiting to come out. And we see this with natural disasters. Why is there so much raping and pillaging and smashing of windows and steam? Because we fall right from the top or wherever we are in Muslim Triangle to the bottom. When it comes to ultimate survival, I mean, guys, if we were living in a village and my son is going to eat tonight or your children's going to eat tonight, I will most likely kill or harm you. Because... And, and the other thing I just want to mention is, and there's nothing wrong with it, but remember we on this discussion today and the circles we typically move in, we are somewhat educated, we earn somewhat good money, we work in technology and stuff, but we are so far removed from most people on earth and how they live. And we know it, and that's okay. And we don't also have to become Mother Teresa's and you know, go and work in the slums. But imagine three people who woke up this morning under a box have this conversation about the future of technology. Totally different on conversation because their day-to-day -day life is survival. Our biggest worry is most likely, can we do that holiday this year or that second holiday? You know, we, I've never in my life gone to bed hungry. Um, I most likely never will. I might not always eat the nice food I want to eat, but you know, so all I'm just saying is to, if we talk about all people on earth, it's a, there are various other worldviews to keep in mind, which is almost impossible for us because when we live the reality of the lives we live. Mm -hmm. you know, one example I want to give, and then I'm going to stop preaching, is uh, I was on a, a webinar a few months back. We were a bunch of white South African men on the webinar, and that's nothing wrong with it. The only challenge is we, have, we represent a very specific, typically a very specific way of seeing the world and stuff. Um, and I'm not saying your way of seeing the world is irrelevant. It's long as it is also influenced by other ways of seeing the world, you know, having that holistic view. And one of the discussion points was that there's no excuse for people to not upskill themselves these days because we've got fast speed internet, we've got smartphones, we've got free videos on YouTube. So every kid that lives in our rural areas or slums must be able to educate themselves. So this is one guy who made this comment and I just said to him, I want to ask you, have you been to these areas that you're talking about? And he said, no, I had the privilege many years ago to spend a year in some of these areas, even, you know, toward the end, even for the official end of apartheid. Think of this, if you, I mean, firstly, there's not electricity in a lot of these areas. We've got a huge electricity crisis. We still deal with the second industrial revolution in our country. We, there's six people living in a small little shack, sharing a phone that is most likely 15 years old. They barely have proper connectivity. So how do we sit on this royal throne looking down on them and say, there's no excuse for not upskilling yourself? So I actually really kind of climbed into this guy a little bit and I, I looked at the recording afterwards, I think maybe I was a bit harsh, but the point is just, we, the Truman Show, have you seen that movie? Mm -hmm. Jim Carrey, one of my favorite. <laughs> and this guy, Ed Harris, who's the, the creator, because I mean, the metaphor behind that movie is incredible, but they interview Ed Harris, the creator, and he says that people uh, accept the realities they are presented with, you know? And that's why, for instance, with our children, it's important. I mean, my, my son asked me the other day, why can't we be richer? 
And uh, because some of his friends, you know, he'll go visit their homes and there's like six bedroom mon suite swimming pools and Ferraris and stuff. And then I, I just bring him back and he's adopted. He was in a place of safety. He's too young to remember, but let me show you how most people live. And then you realize we are some of the richest people. And so it's just about that perspective. So yeah, I'm running on now, we're waffling on. The point is just when we talk about these things is we see it and the future from our view and that's relevant. But like I said, if three of us woke up under a box this morning, how would we speak about the future and about technology? It's just worth considering and worth whiskey. Mm. <laughs> worth yeah. debating. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I, I fully agree with you that it's, it's a lot easier to imagine a future in which uh, ego-driven um, people in position of authority will make, um, shall we say, self-aggrandizing decisions. It's very easy to imagine that. It's very easy to see how uh, people, as you were describing with the vaccine wars, will um, engage in um, in-group bias, uh, meaning uh, you're one of us, uh, we'll look after you, you're one of them, good luck to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's very easy. Uh, but equally so, um, I hold hope for the human spirit. Mm. Um, the, the challenge with all of these, uh, shall we say, less than ethical behaviors is that there is a cost to pay. None of this is free. You don't get away with anything. Yeah? Karma intervenes. Yeah? Um, sooner or later, there will be a cost to pay because I was reflecting on this the other day. Um, virtually all creatures that we're aware of have an instinct for fairness. You see monkeys and monkeys go haywire if they're subject to unfair behavior. If you have two monkeys and one you give a banana, the other one you give just a, a tiny nothing, ugh, unfair, ugh, catastrophe, yeah? And it's the same with humans. If we are subjected to, uh, subjected to enough unfairness, we will rather die. We will rather demolish everything. It's so easy to grab a rock and start smashing things. It's so much harder to build. It's so much harder to, um, to, to develop things. And ultimately, it's in no one's interest that we allow things to deteriorate to the point of acute pain and therefore acute um, violence because we have been unfair with one another, right? And that's why I was talking about the need for reimagining capitalism in such a way that, think of it this way, if I were to give you a wonderful salary for you not doing anything, what will the people around you say? Well, they'd say, well, that's not fair because mm -hmm. you're not exerting yourself. <laughs> yeah. What would they say if you're exerting yourself, but you get a pittance? Well, equally unfair because you're working so well and you're getting almost nothing for it. So if you want to make a personal choice and say, you know what, I'm going to take it easy. So my income is going to be commensurately a little bit lower, but I'll be able to have a, a gentle, fair life. Or I want to apply myself and commensurately, my revenue is bigger, again, in the realms of fairness. Then that kind of a world, again, has an idea of capital because you're using capital to the best ability to create good and better services tomorrow than we had yesterday, but in a manner that is fair to the people that wish to apply themselves. Some people don't even have the ability to apply themselves. I don't know if you've looked into this, but for instance, the U.S. Army is forbidden from uh, allowing itself to um, accept people with an IQ less than 83. And that's 10% of the population. Yeah? A lot of people can't even be allowed into the Army. <laughs> yeah? So what do we do? We need, well, ethically, to look after people. It's Again, perhaps unreasonable to be callous and say, okay, if you're not clever enough, off with your head. Oh, that's that stuff. Yeah. So therefore, 
um, when we're considering, imagine again, general AI, what's the IQ of a general AI? Um, it'll be off the scale. Yeah. So therefore, uh, most humans will be kind of puny intellect uh, comparatively. So then what? <laughs> yeah. So from an oversight perspective, it becomes really um, important that we learn how to dialogue with one another and we learn how to learn from potentially sentient machines as well. Yeah. The thing that um, I find quite intriguing is what kind of ethics will we teach our machines and what kind of ethics will they teach us? Because well, that's the thing we do with dialogue. We teach one another, we, we challenge one another on ethical perspectives. Is we know of various historical traditions, uh, and the, the the school of ethics has been um, founded in various forms of, um, shall we say, religious practice. Um, it'll be really, really fascinating to see what do we do uh, in this space from an oversight perspective. Yeah, what what are your thoughts on ethics yeah. uh, and AI? Massive uh, topic. You referenced the declaration <laughs> of, uh, yeah, where's that can? Let's open it. Uh, Horio, you, you referenced the uh, Declaration of Independence um, uh, earlier. Beautiful document. So, do robots have rights? And if we are its creators, will we see it as less important? Because it's not depending on your worldview, whether it's evolved or whether it's been created by the gods or God or whatever. But one of the, we typically historically hold human life valuable because there is a divine spark. There's a something, there's a consciousness. There's something that makes us more than other primates or other animals, okay? But will, will there be a declaration of independence from the robots one day? You know, I've never thought of it before until this chat, so I know what my next article is going to be about. Yeah, especially <laughs> this whole... This whole sentient thing, I mean, this can of worms, this, I, I watched the, this guy at Google, he had an interview, um, I'm sure he's had a lot of interviews, but he actually, and I posted it on LinkedIn with a comment saying, I'm still not sure what to make of this sentient thing, but he opened up a, a conversation that is very needed, you know, um, and he spoke so well, and he's, it's interesting, his ethos is, is, you know, I don't, I, initially when I saw that news, I thought this is just some person trying to get into the news and trying to make a thing of it. I don't know if, if what he saw was sentient, but man, we have to start talking about it because we're going that way. You know, mm. will computers have consciousness? I mean, we can't even agree today what is consciousness, you know? Um, so is it purely evolutionary, the fact that we've developed a new cortex and, and no longer just have the you know, the so-called lizard brain or primal brain, that we are able to do more than just instinctive fight or flight. You know, we are able to imagine the future. That's why we create, and, and just, I wanted to comment on one of your earlier points, Horio, is it's, we are hardwired to do things that makes us feel, we, you know, we can't, you know, one of the great things I think about, for instance, being retrenched, I've been there, you guys might have been there before. Yes, the one thing is the loss of income, which is a massive problem. The other thing is the loss of feeling value. Mm. So no longer doing things, producing things. <clears throat> I mean, we are, the, as far as we know, the only beings on earth who can um, remember the past and imagine the future. Um, the reason why we create and build buildings and paint Mona Lisa's and stuff, or my, I still have a painting on the wall that my son did when he was four. I'm going to sell it one day <laughs> when he's famous. But because we... We can imagine that which is not as though it was. That's actually from Sacred Writ, that quote, I think. So now, what do we do if the digital assistants, the AIs, the bots that we create, get to that point? You know, something that's interesting at the moment, I'm doing some consulting work around change management because we are bringing digital assistants or, or robots into the team. A lot of companies are now onboarding them with a staff number or a contract number so that they can measure utilization and the like. But we, how, do we, how do we as a human team welcome our new digital friend? 
and interact with it. We give them cute names, feminine or whatever. We anthropomorphize it, essentially. That's a whole other thing to talk about because we, <laughs> through our evolutionary history, we anthropomorphize things like the gods or the stars that we can't understand. I mean, right now, if you Google artificial intelligence, you see robots with little ears and eyes and stuff. It is code, people. It is not a robot. <laughs> but yeah, so sentience is a massive topic, the whole, because the, the metaverse, the brain implants, this, the sentient development of AI, I think is going to start coming together over the next 15, 15 years. And then will it be, will it make us the good beings we actually are? And that's possible. It's a lot that what you've said, Horio, that made me think, because it's interesting, I, I went, I think, over the last year from a, <clears throat> maybe a too optimistic view on AI to potentially a too pessimistic view. And it's always good because it's good to hear another lens and say, shit, okay, maybe I should think about it different. I don't know, I should say that word on, on air, you can edit it out. But yeah, my reading of where this tech is going is just, I can't help but to be pessimistic about it. Yeah, but that's why debates, talks and stuff is important <clears> like this, you know. How do we, from an oversight point of view, manage a team of digital workers do they have rights what if they have self-awareness and they ask for a break or they disagree with you man i don't even know if ethicists are thinking about this yet i don't know but i'll let me stop there and see <laughs> but i love this conversation by the way guys yeah. i'm gonna yeah. well, look at this recording. Um, i'll um i'll draw your attention to um a really interesting podcast called the theories of everything um, Kurt Jemungal. Um And it's fascinating how um, humans have imagined a whole range of theories of everything. And some of these theories of everything have really interesting premises. So um, there's one class of theories of everything that relates to consciousness as being the fundamental element that uh, underpins the universe. In other words, uh, you could imagine that everything is a form of consciousness, that uh, things like um, atoms and electrons and um, uh, elementary particles are forms of scrunch time, uh, scrunched up um, space time, uh, and they are modes of consciousness, if you will. Uh, Panpsychism is um, another word for this idea of the spirit being everywhere. And in a panpsychic um, um, conception, you could have the earth being alive and aware, and the sun being alive and aware, and the galaxy being alive and aware, and the whole of universe being alive and aware. Uh, as a matter of fact, recent um, statistical analysis of uh, galactic cluster structures shows very interesting fractal patterns that are reminiscent of neural constructions in the human brain. So it's really unusual and peculiar that the shape of the universe <laughs> resembles in its fractal geometry that of neural structures in aware beings. So um, it's not an unreasonable hypothesis to, to say that perhaps the universe is also aware, but um, think of it another way. The lifespan of a, of a typical human is barely, let's call it a hundred rotations of a planet around its home star, whereas the lifespan uh, of the universe is, we know not uh, how, how much longer the universe will stick around, but we know that at least 13 and something billions of years have already passed and we have the current uh, construction. So um, equally so, you could look at the sun and say, yeah, there are rhythms to the sun, but they're about 11 years. So if that's one heartbeat and the sun lives billions of years, then the thoughts of the sun take centuries to unfold <laughs> as opposed to the thoughts of a human that uh, take moments or, or, or seconds or maybe minutes at the most. So um, theories of everything uh, brings to mind all sorts of interesting possibilities. And from that perspective, I would argue that uh, it's less a question of should machine sentiences 
have rights well as long as you're conscious and sentient doesn't matter you're part of this universe you're equally viable and valid as another creature of the universe you live in the universe you manifest your consciousness uh, in it and why not <laughs> yeah. you're you're worthy of the same kind of joy and collaboration and and connection and uh, equally so another thing that you might consider is we are probably not alone. Um, you see recent um, evidence from um, um, USS Nimitz and so on that there are unexplained aerial phenomena. Um, there are maybe other beings, maybe of this planet, maybe of other uh, planets or universes or galaxies, we know not. But it's highly likely that humans, they're not alone. <laughs> um, it may be that life isn't oh my god an accident and it's only on earth in the whole universe nah, highly unlikely it's possibly much likelier that life is the norm you see extremophiles you see uh beings uh living in a um, not just a carbon cycle but a sulfur cycle in deep caves and so on you see um uh, all sorts of creatures living in extreme temperatures so it's perfectly conceivable that if we were to send the probe and sink it um through the ice of uh, europa we may find in its deep water ocean again different forms of of life so <laughs> from that perspective given this this broader uh, aspect i'm again hopeful that not being alone and um, being part of the, the, the circle of life, even if we may have a dark dystopian uh, interval, we may emerge out of it uh, eventually into a broader, uh, shall we say, galactic or dare I uh, dream even pan-galactic civilization where um, we, we take a much more, um, shall we say, um, I don't like to, to call it enlightened, but, but more, put it this way, um, this brings to mind the idea of what kind of humans do you want? Do you want humans that are ineffective, that are afraid, that are um, powerless? I think not. Um, this is where um, that uh, fragment from the Bible that says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Unfortunately, that's an inaccurate translation. Uh, the original Greek is something along the lines of makarioi oi praes. And that essentially means, um, it, it refers to uh, the, 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 the stallions of war, um, praes. They are they are said to be meeked. But that essentially means that it's vigor. It's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic energy is actually put under the control of the rider. So in other words, the meek, they're not the subservient ones. They're not the ineffective ones. They're not the, um, the ones that just uh, put up with any kind of abuse that is uh, heaped at them. No, 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 no. The meek in this uh, interpretation, they are the ones that are so scary. They're so badass that you don't want to mess with them. Yeah, they're the ones that have all of that um, storm of violence well under control. They are scary, badass people that you don't want to mess with. And therefore, they can be kind, they can be compassionate, they can be mindful and gentle with others. To me, that is the extreme form of power, the power of giving life, not taking away life. Um, if you're able to allow your enemies to live, because you hope for their redemption if you learn to forgive your enemies that to me is a far more important and and powerful way of of living life so from an ethical perspective i think it is our duty that's my um, limited perspective it is our duty to treat all others with respect and kindness but equally so we need to be prepared to be scary badass people as well <laughs> But keep it under gentle control. Yeah. For, for a while there, I thought we were really going on a tangent away from the oversight conversation, but I think we've pulled it back nicely because, I mean, we can speak about um, emotional intelligence or, or even self-awareness, but back to what makes a good leader is a lot of the stuff we're talking about now. It's, it's an, I've never seen that the meek shall inherit the earth in that way. It almost, for me, my metaphor would be 
I've got so much power to do either good or bad that I have to control it like I do the horse in order to steer it in the direction of doing good. Now, leaders, and especially on, if you think of narcissistic leaders, and it sometimes seems to me that it takes a narcissistical psychopath to hit the top of a corporate because the bodies that lie in the wake on your journey to get to the top is immense. But why should that be the norm? Why mm -hmm. can... Um, you know, I, I read once that the, the best ideal of governance is an, um, what's the word? It is a altruistic dictator or be benevolent dictator. Now, that's a big philosophical thing to talk about. <laughs> um, but what if as a leader, whether you're the top of the stack or mid-management or whatever, what if you can take your, hopefully, leadership abilities, but your strengths, your insight, etc., and steer it like the horse in that metaphor to do good to others. So I right. think it's really right. come nicely full circle in a way <laughs> to the That's topic right. at hand, even though we almost <laughs> fell off the philosophical <laughs> cliff there for a while. <laughs> yeah, we were all, almost going to grab our lightsabers to go fight the ball. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Oh. I viewed uh, on, on Netflix, there was this... Um, a documentary about the algorithms that intentionally creates division, that intentionally creates polarization uh, in communities. And it's acceptable to be racist and make racist comments on social media. And, you know, that, that, that's the stuff that gets promoted. And it was quite upsetting looking at that. And I was wondering when I looked at that is, where is the decision making? that allowed that to happen? Where is the ethics? Where is the, the governance and the oversight that allowed that to happen? Were the focus too much on money or were the focus actually considering what could be the unintended consequences down the road? And uh, as a result, I, my kids are not gonna get close to social media until they're 33. Um, it's <laughs> good luck with that <laughs> but it is it was quite upsetting to see how easily they've hacked us and how easily they can manipulate things the, and that's a lack a gross lack of oversight right there and whether we choose to turn the, turn turn the eye away or actually address it that's where the dystopian society would would start or not start. So um, I don't know if you've seen that Netflix uh, it's a yeah, documentary. I, I, there are a few. I, this could be coded bias. Yeah, it's a brilliant no. documentary. Um, but the point being, I mean, you're raising a very great point here now. I mean, we there's Timot Gebru, who is Ethiopian American. Um, she was um, senior in Google. And a few years ago, you know, she wrote a paper highlighting the, the biases and the irresponsible use of their data. And they asked her to, she published it internally, they asked her to retract it. She didn't. So they say they fired her. She say that she resigned, but she's become a, a, a great voice in our world for responsible use of this technology. I mean, we had the, the, the congressional hearings, was it, I can't even remember if it's some months or years back, and I can't remember the lady's name from Facebook. The point is these uh, so-called whistleblowers are shut down or these big companies are trying to shut them down. Cancel culture, and, yeah. Yeah, but why? And then the same with this guy now about the sentience because he's also kind of being shut down, it seems. And now I'm thinking if there's, there's, if there's smoke, there's a fire. Why are you shutting these people down? Why are you getting kind of rid of them? It seems that the drive for investor returns and for profit by far exponentially overrides any thinking of doing this right. And that is the evidence we're getting from these people who are working in these trenches. So, and, and that's maybe a good way to pointing to this potential um, dystopian, or at least uh, yeah. different yeah. bad use yeah. of this technology, because yeah. we're not regulating it. I mean, I don't know about New Zealand guys, but in, in South Africa, we've got fairly good privacy, although I've never seen it. I mean, we've recently had our biggest, um, uh, credit bureau was hacked 48 million people's worth of data was stolen according to the law there's a 10 year and or 10 million rand penalty for the directors it's happened with this game one of our big pharmacy groups it's happened with a number of others there's been no enforcement okay but we we're not even near the regulation of the use of data 
from an ethical point of view. I, I, we see it in the European Union a bit, but we, I, we, it's almost like regulating nuclear power. It should not be a debate. It's how we do it, of course, you know, but yeah. So there's most likely, I think these people, these timid debris of the world have not even scratched the surface of the shit that's going on in the Googles of the world that we don't even want to know, I suspect. I don't know. What do you think? <sighs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, my thought on this is, uh, put it this way, um, one way or another, um, humanity will have to go through the pains of, um, of development. Because um, at the moment, we almost have um, a glorification of childhood. We've forgotten how to become adults. And it's like, ah, mommy, did you hear what she said? Oh, I'm not playing with her anymore. It's literally like that. Yeah. So we're, we're in, 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 in two groups, right? So uh, we're good and you're bad. Ah, you're evil people. You should be, you should die. Yeah. And when that's the amount of political discourse, who benefits? <laughs> yeah, your enemies benefit, of course, because you're at, you're at each other's throats, and you're you're. It's like, come on, whoa! And the adults in the room are where? <laughs> mm -hmm. And we we allow this to, to to keep happening. Why? How come? Well, we allow it because hey, there's lots of money to be made uh, out of it. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Unfortunately, um, humans are fabulous procrastinators. We don't seem to, to welcome the idea of discipline, right? Because what would be required is some discipline to combat these things and to learn how to engage in better dialogue with one another. And yet, uh, that's hard. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes courage, um, and it takes a will of enough people to say, no, enough, you know, uh, call your representative and give them an earful and say, no, 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 stop with this foolishness, get mm -hmm. to the table, start talking, yeah, but unfortunately, at the moment, most of us are hoodwinked into, eh, it's okay, it's whatever, yeah. not only that, but it's, it's like, such disillusionment. It's, it's very fashionable to be disillusioned yeah? and, and, and to be uh, frustrated and say, oh, these politicians. Ah, ah, ah. But I would argue that we have the politicians we deserve because we've elected them, we've tolerated them, we've enabled them to get away with whatever they're getting away with. Yeah. yeah? So you, you're channeling your inner uh, Jordan Peterson here, uh, Horia. <laughs> I can hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, in terms of, of that, uh, just wanted to, to, to quote uh, another guy we interviewed, uh, uh, Al Shalloway, and he said a few episodes back is sometimes if people don't believe you, you have to let them be on the electric fence. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Learning, learning from your mistakes or learning from your experience. And that's, that's probably what humanity need to go through. This yeah. is what you've been saying. Yeah, that's the thing. So from that perspective, I take, uh, I take um, a joy in the fact that there are great signs of hope. So uh, you look at um, humanocracy, the work of the, the new human movement and Gary Hamill uh, and what he has to, to say there. He has an interesting podcast as well. You look at the, the guys that uh, have done the work of corporate rebels, uh, corporate-rebels.com. Um, um, you see examples in the various uh, companies in their bucket list. So there are numerous opportunities and examples around the world where people can actually get together better. Because ultimately, um, what's increasingly happening is large corporations are finding it tougher and tougher to uh, attract people to their foolishness, unless they genuinely promote uh, um, a, a healthy, uh, an attractive uh, environment of, of joy. And if that ain't happening, then guess what? Humans are going to vote with their feet and go and collaborate in organizations that are more attractive to the human spirit and i think we have a fantastic opportunity for using technology to help 
uh, in that as opposed to um, the other way around as using technology as the uh, the, the great um, sort of pincer to sort of torture humanity with. <laughs> so again, I'll I'll agree to disagree with you on this one, Johan. I will um, retain my my hope uh, for optimism for the future, uh, and I'm I'm not aiming for utopia. I'm aiming for um, something human, uh, something driven by 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 connection and by a spirit of of custodianship, if you will. Right. I think we have a responsibility to look after the planet, look after each other. And why not, if we develop the, the ability and the wisdom, look after the universe, right? Um, um, to our, our, our galaxy and beyond. Uh, it, it all depends on our ability to, to be driven by, um, by connection, by harmony, by, dare I say it, love. Yeah. Uh, listen, you've certainly given me a lot to think about today, and that's great. Um, and I wish we could have had this in person, mm. this meeting. I found it yeah. so enjoyable. It's so nice just to talk about these things and they're kind of a safe space, trigger stuff to think about. And, and guys, we should have more of these conversations. And you sure. guys, especially with sure. this podcast, you know, push the boundaries, man. We have to debate. We That's can't right. just, you know, to horror to your point, just to almost be happy in our slumber. Just don't bother me. No, I want to think and bother people and be bothered by them, <laughs> you know. So yeah, what a well, it's a good start for my morning. I think I don't know what the time is there. <laughs> okay, <but. laughs> right. Oh. Okay, we, we'll take authorship of your next three articles. Thank you, you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I got paid for it, you had a foot to stand Fair on. Enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, Johan, thank you for exploring uh, the, uh, th this domain with us today. And, and I, I know we went really far. We went into uh, different dimensions, uh, literally. Um, and uh, we, it, it's good to, to, um, to learn and see and ask these questions about where governance or, and oversight, where, where, where do we need to put our finger on things, um, especially in uh, with, with the potential futures that, that we spoke about. Um, so thank you for your time uh, for today. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate you being willing to deep dive into this so early in the morning for you without whiskey. <laughs> so um, <laughs> It was a great honor, guys. I, I love listening to some of the podcasts. A topic to discuss next time maybe is if the bulk or the whole of your team are um, sentient AI beings, how does the topic of oversight apply to them or it? Second bottle wow. of whiskey. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I already have some thoughts uh, on that. Um, the basic notion is there's a leadership superpower. And that leadership superpower is often neglected. And that is the ability to detach, to literally take a step away, take a breath, look around and make a call. Because um, our cognitive capacity is usually so limited and so restricted. And so when we're delving into the work, we're not noticing uh, the bigger realm. Uh, another great book to consider in this space is Ian McGilchrist's uh, The Master and His Emissary that does a really interesting examination of the, uh, the bicameral arrangement of our brains with the left brain being much more um, focused on grasping and analyzing and gripping uh, the world around us and the, the um, right hemisphere um, taking a step back and noticing and being more integrative. So um, there's, there's a clue in how nature seems to operate in the need for, for good oversight. Because if you're just chasing the prey, chasing the prey, then the bigger prey or different prey is going to chase you and kind of <laughs> your lunch, <laughs> right? Yeah. So from that perspective, there's a profound need for, for balanced oversight, not too much, but not too little mm. in order to, to thrive and survive well in uh, the world that is, well, as we say, nature is red and tooth and claw. That's why I said we need to be badass. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Johan, for, for your time today. Thank you, listeners, for, um, for, for bearing with us. 
uh, and uh, really hope you enjoy uh, you enjoyed this session. I'm Aldu. I'm Horia. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.